When we study the Bible, we study what leads us from earth to heaven because we learn God's will for us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. As you study the New Testament, you find the Lord's will. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. From Romans 1, 16, we learn the gospel is His power to save us. And in that New Testament system, not only is there the truth set out how to become a Christian and how to live a faithful Christian life in the Lord's church where he adds all those who are baptized into Christ, Acts 2.47 and Galatians 3 and verse 26 and 27. But there is also the disciplinary measures to keep children of God faithful. There is corrective discipline, and you may say, well, we're going to hear another lesson, though we haven't in a while, on corrective discipline, even to the point to where when people are obstinate in their sins and refuse all overtures of faithful brethren to get them to repent, that finally, and each case must be handled on its own merits, finally, the fellowship of the faithful is withdrawn from that person. There are two reasons for that. First of all, it's the last-ditch effort to get faithful brethren, or all faithful brethren, to get them to see, uh, the, or get the unfaithful brethren to see that they need to repent, that they're lost, they're separated from God. The church only withdraws fellowship from people who are separated from God and separated from God by their transgressions, their sins. The other reason is to keep the church pure. Now, it doesn't take a genius to read 1 Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians 5, and see that that's exactly what the Holy Spirit had Paul write concerning a specific sin that was in the church at Corinth regarding a man who had his father's wife and how the church wasn't doing what God said about it. And uh, we read 2 Corinthians to find out that when they did, the man repented. There are a multiplicity of scriptures that talk about how God expects the church to be pure. It's his family. And when you think about the conversion process of becoming a Christian, then, of course, that would indicate that a person has on his mind all that he can have to serve God all the days of his life. But people can sin. In the New Testament, most of it is written to Christians to keep them from sinning either from completely rejecting the New Testament system that they once believed and obeyed, or to help them overcome a trespass that they've gotten themselves into and it's separated them from God. So we understand the reason for discipline. And you might break it down to the point to where you read your New Testament and say, who are the subjects for corrective discipline? And you then might look and say, well, what manner of action should be taken? And each one of those are important to study, but that's not what we're going today. That's only what I've said thus far is only introductory to what we want to say. The other part of that is that after a scriptural withdrawal of fellowship has been done by the faithful members of the church, uh, what then? What, what do we do when it comes to the person who is still so obstinate in a sin of sins that they will not repent even though the church has withdrawn fellowship from them? Well, if you go through the scriptures, you can systematically see what the Lord has said in his last one in the Testament ought to be the case when it comes to faithful members of the church dealing with them. So we want to look at that this afternoon, and when we look at that, after we're finished, then we'll give some practical applications. And I will tell you up front now one reason we're going to do this. Some years ago, I came across a person who said, well, parents are not obligated to God to withdraw fellowship from the children. Well, if there's that exception in the New Testament, I want to know about it. <laughs> but I can't find that exception. Nevertheless, this member of the church said that. Then there have been writings that said, well, you withdraw fellowship from 
your own family members by simply letting them know when the church has done so, as we just described earlier, that they're out of duty to God, they're separated from God, they're lost in their sins, they must repent and come back to the Lord. Now that I've told you that, then it's business as usual. That is a view that has been set out because the idea is, well, the family has to continue on as a family. Whether it's people who, kids who have left the home or whether it's brothers or sisters who are mature or even whether it would be family members still within a given home. You just simply tell them that they're out of duty to God, that you can't fellowship them, and then you go on as if nothing has ever happened. First of all, it removes the speciality of the Lord's church as the family of God and all that the New Testament teaches about the purity of every member of the church. And that God expects out of the church conduct considerably different, radically different from people who would be called worldly and non-converted. Now, having said that, let's ask the question, uh, what happens in our dealings as faithful Christians with members who have been scripturally withdrawn from? First of all, we have to note who they are. We note who they are. In Romans 16, in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Notice, contrary to the doctrine, which ye have learned. And notice, and avoid them. Now look to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, what's the reason? That he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you. And then the Apostle Paul to the church at uh, Philippi, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Brethren, be you followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. You'll notice the word in sample in the King James, and it's not used anymore. An example is a pattern. An in sample, as it was used then, means a pattern for us who are inside the church. We use example now just for any pattern. But in sample carried with it that idea. Then parenthetically he begins, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now what do we learn from this? Mark and note a certain kind of people. Basically those who refuse to live like the New Testament says Christians ought to live. Those who have been overtaken in a trespass and refuse all overtures of faithful brethren to get them to repent. This is how you deal with them. You know who they are. You know the situation. If you look at all the New Testament teaches regarding the process whereby a person has the fellowship of faithful brethren withdrawn from them and every faithful brother has done what the Lord said they ought to do because they love the Lord, they love His will, and they love the souls of men and women, boys and girls who get caught up in sin, then people are going to have done to them what the Bible says. They're going to know their sins. It's just in the nature of the case of carrying out the Lord's will on the matter. Then notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Then he says that if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Well, there it is again. So we're to note who they are, and notice we're to keep no company with them. Look at 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. 
1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. Paul says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Now I don't know of anything that would, one, any one thing that would be a sign of friendship, fellowship, and proper association other than when we sit down and enjoy a meal together. So in reality, this is a synecdoche where a part stands for the whole. And in this case, we're talking about how faithful brethren treat those who will not repent and have had the church fellowship withdrawn from them. So it's not just a matter of saying we'll have a, we won't be able to eat with you, but then we'll go out and play golf. Or we will go do something else together, but then we won't go eat together. It's the idea of any fraternal association that would send a message to anybody that this person is exemplary of what a Christian ought to be by the way they do or not do, as the case may be. So with such an one know not to eat means don't keep company with him in such a way as that you send a message to other members of the church and to those especially outside the church that this person is living a life exemplary of what God wants people in the church to do and how they're to live. You have the do not eat in 1 Corinthians 5.11 again. Again, showing there can't be that particular association. Now, let me pause here and say this. Do you have any problem understanding that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God in the plan of salvation, Romans 1, um, Romans 10 and verse 17? Do you have any problem of understanding that, that you have to hear the gospel? It's obligatory. You must. That you must have faith in Christ built upon the gospel. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. You must confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10.10. You must be baptized for the remission of sins. We understand that's from the Lord and that is the plan of salvation. No man becomes a Christian except that they from the heart comply with each step in God's plan of salvation. Well, what about these words from the same New Testament concerning faithful members of the church dealing with those who have had the fellowship of the church withdrawn from them because of their continual obstinacy to practice wrong? In 2 John, in verse 10, for those who would teach false doctrine, he says, well, you do not receive him into your house. That helps me understand further about the matter of not eating with somebody. It helps extend a commentary on the meaning of I can't have that kind of association with somebody. I do not at all under normal, underscore normal, circumstances, day-to-day -day operations have that kind of relationship. I want to send the message to that person and to the church and to anybody around that this person is not in fellowship with God. This person is not living a faithful Christian life. This person needs to repent. But this person won't repent. Thus, God says, just like in the plan of salvation, that one must know and hear and obey, God says of these, here is how faithful Christians are to deal with them. Second John 10 and 11, I can't bid a person teaching false doctrine God's speed. Could you, could you bid God's speed to a person guilty of fornication who's a Christian and won't repent? Could you invite him into your house as if nothing at all was wrong when it comes to a member of the Lord's church being a thief or being a homosexual? Now, out here in the world, Paul will reason in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, he will reason, well, you can't stop that in the world. They, they don't pretend to be Christians. But we're talking about dealing with this special institution, God's family, the church, you see, you're, you're, you're converted. You're a step way up above the world who operates only by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You are the people who have sought first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You trust in God by obedience to the gospel and living your life like the Lord said. Then you'll notice our Lord in teaching in Matthew 18, 17, 
where he's talking about where the whole matter starts between one brother and another brother, one committing sin against another brother, that finally when it comes down to that one who is guilty, not having repented, that the whole church is brought in on the matter. And if you won't hear the whole church, Jesus said it this way to Jews who understood exactly how they treated heathens and publicans. Count him or let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Matthew 18, 17. Well, how was that? What association did the Jew under the law have if they were faithful to the law with a heathen man and a publican? All you have to do is go over and read Acts chapter 10 where the Lord was showing that those um, divisions would not exist any longer in the kingdom that existed under the law in the relationship of Jews to Gentiles. Remember, Peter does not want to have anything at all to do with Cornelius. And it takes a miracle that shows him three times from God that what God is called uncommon, don't you call common. What God has approved of, don't you disapprove of. Because the Jews did not associate fellowship with heathens and publicans. Now the Lord is saying... In the church, when a brother or sister has committed sin and refuses to repent to the point where the church must withdraw the fellowship from them, here's how you treat them. Well, I can't know that unless I know how the Jews treated heathens and publicans. And that's what it says, just like it says, baptism for the remission of sins. That's what it says. Just like it talks about the taking of the Lord's Supper and the worship assembly on the first day of every week, Acts 20 and 7. That's what it says, just like the Bible is taught to be the Word of God. And we must study it, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 2 Timothy 2, 15. So how can I be selective and say, well, here's one thing, but then over here on this, I treat that a little different. In Romans 16, 17, we're taught to avoid and the same is taught in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5 and 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. And that's said to a young preacher for his own personal benefit, but for him to teach to the church as an evangelist concerning their relationship, or lack of it as the case may be, with those who have had the fellowship of the church scripturally withdrawn from them. Paul says to another young preacher concerning those who are out of harmony with God's will in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 10, that you are to reject them. Now notice all of this is passively done by the church. It's not like uh, the Muslims who say you'll convert or we'll whack your head off. Or if you go wrong, we have a right to kill you. It's just simply saying if you choose to live contrary to God's will in view of the fact you've obeyed the gospel and remember the church, then you need to know that we can't associate with you in any way that would show the world that we condone your sinful activity. But now you have coming down here in 2 Thessalonians 3.15, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Well, it seems that some will look at all of what I've said on the other eight points or the way the New Testament says to treat such people and say, well... That means that you, as he is a brother, you can just continue, now that you've admonished him, to go ahead and, as if nothing's ever happened. Brethren, everything I have just said thus far from the scriptures is admonishing him as a brother. Is showing him that you love him. Is showing him, or her as the case may be, of course, that you care for his soul because you cannot associate with him in any way that is in a sharing relationship. Now, you know who they are. You don't keep company with them. You don't eat with them. You don't receive them into your house. You do not bid them Godspeed. You don't count them as, or you do count them as a heathen and a publican. You avoid them. You reject them. You don't count them as an enemy, but admonish them as a brother. Brethren, you know, that sort of goes back to the false concept most people have and many in the church have concerning the definition of loving our brethren. Let's face it, a great many people think loving our brethren is letting them do as they please don't tell them anything about it. Then you become the unloving one if you do point out that you've been overtaken in a trespass. And you do try to exercise what Paul said, 
that ye which are spiritual restore such in one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Don't we know, as I said in the beginning, that if you're going to have any hope whatsoever of saving the soul of a person who is so bold in the sin and hardened of heart that they will not listen to the church as people plead with them, their brothers and sisters plead with them to repent of sin, that when that fellowship is withdrawn, that's a last-ditch effort to make them ashamed of themselves for living such a life that's contrary to the Bible and bringing reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ. It should be reminding them of what they did when they became Christians and why and what took place in their conversion process into what they were baptized and who their Savior is and what Jesus did for them to save them. And now they've repudiated him by engaging in sin and refusing to repent. On the other hand, if they're going to go ahead and persist in such sin, then it keeps the church pure. For a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So now when it comes down to some problems, because you could have, this is not beyond reality, it's not a fantasy, it's not a hypothetical that just could not take place. You could have a young man, and I'm not just leaving the ladies alone, it could be a young woman, who might be 12 years old, raised in a godly family, who hears the gospel and obeys the gospel, but by 15, 16, or 17, still under the jurisdiction of parents. That child gets into all sorts of trouble, will not repent, and everybody's done what they could, including mother and daddy and the elders and the church, to try to get that child to repent, and they won't, and the church must withdraw fellowship from them. Well, the child's still in the jurisdiction of parents. Well, the home still has an obligation, doesn't it? Certainly it does. The parents still have an obligation to that child who's a minor and under their jurisdiction. Well, what are you going to do about the matter of which such a one know not to eat? Well, I don't find that a problem at all. Mama fixed dinner for him. He can eat in his room by himself. I don't have to eat with him. So just because certain problems arise because of relationships does not mean all we've seen here that's to be applied to erring members who have been withdrawn from cannot be applied. It may pose a problem. In fact, I will say this. You've got a double opportunity to cause a child in that situation to change because the church can only do so much. It can only passively withdraw fellowship from them. But the home has an obligation where you will stay in your room. You will not do this and you will not do that and this you will not be privileged to because you have chosen not to live according to the truth you once obeyed. I know of a situation where a young woman wanted to obey the gospel. A girl, I shouldn't say young woman, she was just a girl. And she came in crying because she wanted to obey the gospel. Yet years later, she parted off into all sorts of immoral activities and never has come out. Well, now what do we do about something like that? If someone like that is still under the jurisdiction of parents. Uh, well, we still have to note who they are. We still have an obligation as parents to them, but we can limit that and we can bring to bear parental discipline that adds to the withdrawal discipline of the church. Some of this, sometimes it seems to me that it's just a lot easier to say, like that woman did quite a few years ago, well, I just don't think parents have to withdraw fellowship from the children. Remember what I said about what Brother G.K. Wallace used to say when somebody came up with some harebrained notion? Who told you that? Where did you learn that? How is it that you have the idea, where did you get it from, that your children, if they go wrong and won't repent, and they're children of God and the church must withdraw from them, where did you learn that it doesn't apply to them simply because they're your children? Did it ever dawn on anybody that we're all somebody's children? That we are all somebody's father or mother if we are, have children, of course. They're always family relationships, and I don't find that to be an exception when it comes to know who they are, don't keep company with, don't eat with, do not receive into your house in the sense of showing that they are 
to be handled as if nothing's ever happened. Now, we can carry it further. What if the child of God who's still in your jurisdiction is acting so contrary that he's hurtful to the siblings and the rest of the house? Say he's on drugs. Say he's mixed up with a gang. He's not going to stay in my house. The law enforcement officers will be called and he'll be taken out for the safety of the rest of the house. Don't you have a parental obligation to do that? Don't you owe that to yourself, your wife, and the other siblings who are not mixed up in that? Yes, you can do that. Church can't do it. Mom and daddy can. If you had a child, well, let me give you an example. This man was already married. And daddy and I, as before my sister were born, it was a rainy night. These folks lived next door to us. I was probably about four years old. But this really stuck in my mind. You know, some things happen that are kind of traumatic and that just kind of plants themselves in your mind. <laughs> well, this um, man lived next door. At least he was over there with his wife. And that's where his daddy and mother lived. And his brother and sister-in-law were there. And all of a sudden, uh, daddy and I were in the bed together. He's reading me a story. And it was thundering and lightning. And all of a sudden, bang, bang, bang. And daddy's name being called out. And bang, bang, bang. Can you come to the door? Bang, bang, bang. Come, come help us. And Daddy said, stay here, wait a minute. And we, he knew who the lady was. And it was this man's, uh, this man's wife who was coming over begging for help. Well, this fella, her husband, had come home drunker than a skunk. And he was wanting to whip everybody over there in the house. Well, they had to do something. And before the constable could get there, uh, had somebody come help them to keep him from hurting everybody else. Well, they left me all alone in that bed in that house at Thunder and Lightning and all that episode. I didn't stay there. <laughs> See, my grandparents had lived in the house before these folks lived in that house, and I knew all about it, and I just simply hooked my little toes over the fence and climbed over and went in that house, and they had him down in the doorway. See, they got him down in the doorway because if you can get him down in the doorway, you can't roll over and they can control him better. And that's where they had him. Daddy was so upset, didn't even recognize me. <laughs> Uh, do you think if they'd all been Christians and this one was acting that way, surely you wouldn't, you wouldn't think he's faithful in that activity. Do you think it would have been right to call the police and have him escorted to jail? Certainly. Brethren, we need to think a little bit about how we deal with our family members who go astray. I'm talking about members of the church who get it caught up in sin and then they won't repent. The family can bring more to bear upon them more than the church can that may help them be brought to repentance. But I don't know that we recognize that because nowadays I don't know that we recognize the power of the home over influencing molding children in the first place or how they should engage in discipline, especially corrective discipline with children. Now what are you going to do if they're outside the home and they've had the fellowship of the church scripturally withdrawn from them. And you have told them now you're lost. And you know I think you're lost because I can show you by the Bible. And I started to ask Jeff because he could do this, uh, but I didn't want to do it. I started to have him come up here and he was going to be my little brother who's got caught up in sin. And I was going to say to him, now Jeff, you know I love you. And he's going to respond, I don't care. And I say, and you know the church withdrawn from you because of the sin you're in. And he's going to say, I don't care. And you say, well, you know that you're going to hell if you die this way. And he's going to say, I don't care. But the Bible teaches it. It's God's word. I don't care. Okay, but you know that you're lost. I don't care. Now, uh, when are you arriving at Thanksgiving dinner for us to all sit down and eat together and have a big time? Does that not just kind of go bing bong, bing bong, bing bong in view of all we said, know who they are, don't keep company with, don't eat with, admonish him as a brother? Yes, what have I been doing? And then by my actions, show him I can't company with you in any way that condones your actions. All this is, is simply emotions overriding the plain word of God. Now, Jeff said something this morning about the law of non-contradiction. 
That's what's happening here. This law of non-contradiction in practical Christianity is being violated. I'm telling you you're lost, but I'm going to act like you're saved. That won't work. Now that's where the law of non-contradiction also comes down to practicality and how you live the Christian life in given particular actions. I would like to think that what I preached to you this afternoon concerning how you treat one who has been scripturally withdrawn from, especially one who's a member of your family, really didn't need to be preached, but I'm finding out in some places it does. But folks, listen, there is no exception made for your child or for my mama or daddy or for my siblings. When it comes to them being Christians, them sinning, them not repenting, and the church having to draw fellowship from them, and how I treat them when they're withdrawn from. If not, you have made null and void the only way and the only hope you have of ever getting them to turn away. You know, God knows how to do this. And I know there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But God knows how to bring somebody to the Christ, and He knows how to keep someone faithful in Christ, and He knows how to bring some member of the church who's gone astray back to Christ if they can be won back to Christ. It's up to us as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular to recognize their are no family exceptions. It may prove a problem more because of family relationships. I recognize that. But that doesn't remove from us the obligation God's placed on us. I want to know where we learn that just because some things are a bigger problem in serving God, that that gives us the right to say, we'll water it down. We had a lesson on that regarding truth and watering down truth and how you destroy it when you do. People aren't thinking, I'm afraid, and they're not uh, being logical in their application of the teaching of the New Testament regarding how we're to deal with members who have been scripturally withdrawn from and especially those who have been drawn from who are fleshly members of our own family. But I can't find anything. Now, if you can find something in the New Testament that says we're to deal with our fleshly family members who have been withdrawn from, different, making allowances for them that we are not to for those who are outside of our fleshly family, I would be more than happy. I mean, it would, it would make it a lot easier, wouldn't it, to be able to do it this way. Why, you wouldn't have to do all sorts of things. But I can't find it. It's just not there. So what do you think about it? Well, the only thing I can say is we better think about it like we think about the plan of salvation as it's set out in the scriptures. The plan when it comes to the church, its work, organization, and worship, and anything else God's oblig God has obligated us to do in the scriptures that we might be faithful to him. So while there's room for studying even more about the processes of withdrawing fellowship and those matters, we need to think seriously about how we deal with those in our own families in particular when the fellowship of the church has been withdrawn from them and scripturally done. We'll close the lesson here, but I hope you'll take these things to heart. Study them on your own. Open your Bible, go to the revealed mind of God, and honestly study it and draw your conclusions. God has given us this Bible to unite us, not divide us. I think sometimes we forget that. It only divides us because we let our viewpoints change us rather than let the Bible unite us. If you're not a child of God this afternoon in the process of discussing this subject, we've told you what to do that the Bible says to become a Christian. And we certainly dealt with the child of God who sins. And if you need to repent, we urge you to do that and pray God for forgiveness, having confessed your sins. That's the way that's right. Brethren, you can't be wrong. It's delivered from a loving God whose son died for you and me. 
And if we're going to remain faithful in the church, we must remain in contact with the blood of Christ that flows ever in the body of Christ, covering the faithful. When we see a sin in our lives or the lives of our brethren, let us labor with all we can to do what we can to bring people back to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, our labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you're subject to the good call of our Christ to salvation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.